many of you are not going to like some of the things I'm going to say. Uh, many of you are going to say, well, okay, we already know that. Let's move on. But I am going to change the title of my talk, for one thing, just so it won't be a surprise. I think the title of this, of this small uh, intervention should be Realities of Health, or maybe Mega Phenomena in Health. And I, I want to bring to you the, what I have learned over the last decade studying health and science and medicine. Even though I'm a physicist, I want to tell you the most important things that I've learned. And one thing that we do as physicists is we try to ignore the details and go to the big phenomena right away, the really big things that are happening, the, really, the things that are obvious even if most people are not seeing them. We try to identify that and we try to talk about it and in order to understand it. And so that's, that's been my approach in all of this. And as many of you know, I've mainly used all-cause mortality as a tool, and I'll be talking about that tomorrow. But right now, I want to give you some, some the deepest thoughts that I could give about health. And they're as follows. Um, first of all, and we've, I'm sure you've all learned this. There was a lecture on it in medical school and so on. And we've heard this before, but I'm going to say it because we don't say it often enough. And it's way more important than we acknowledge even when we do say it. And it's the following thing. Psychological stress and social isolation are dominant determinants of an individual's health. And that causes a, a suppression of your immune system, and you're going to get some kind of infection, cancer, heart disease, and very often the lungs are very exposed to the environments and they're subjected to all the bacteria that you live with all the time, you get bacterial pneumonia. This is a big, big killer. And it's a huge killer when a society um, is stressed, meaning all of its individuals are stressed. And psychological stress is not just, oh, I feel stressed. No, no, it's a very real thing, and it has a very special character. The kind of psychological stress that kills you is when your entire world is turned upside down. When your place within the society disappears. So you lose your job, you lose your house, you get sued, you, I'm talking about the middle class now, or you, 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 you completely cannot sustain your family and all of these things. These big life-changing uh, 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 times of our lives are uh, these devastating tectonic shifts where you, you lose, you, you, your whole life you thought you had a place in the world and it's gone. That will kill you within a very short time. It's, it's deadly psychological stress. That, those are the big life changers. But even the usual stress of living in society, because that's the other big truth that I want to tell you about that I've discovered, is that we as humans, we as social animals, we always occupy a dominance hierarchy, a social dominance hierarchy. That is how we organize our societies. Because we are social animals, it is something that we inherited. Uh, uh, we just have to accept that. It is a fundamental truth of how we organize societies. Okay? So the stress that is intended to keep you in your place within that dominance hierarchy is an everyday chronic stress. And the stressors have to keep changing how they're going to stress you because you get habituated to the stress. So they have to randomly hit you with hard things every once in a while to really Make sure you understand what your place is. That stress is one of the biggest determinants of health. It has been shown study after study that your place within the dominance hierarchy is the first thing that will tell you how young you will be when you die and how sick you will be and how often you will be sick. Okay? So dominance hierarchy is the organizer. You can call it... You, all these words about politics, uh, communism, democracy anarchism, whatever, they're all, they're all, as human groups, we make and maintain dominance hierarchies. That's the organizing principle. And this is something that took me a long time to understand uh, through studying uh, uh, politics. So psychology is important. Uh, dominance hierarchy is important. And what I have learned about dominance hierarchy 
is I'm in contact with a physicist friend of mine who wrote a very important paper about dominance hierarchy. He, as a physicist, as a theorist, he tried to understand how can you model this organizing into a dominance hierarchy and what stabilizes it? How does it hold together? What, what keeps it together? And what he discovered through his very beautiful, very elegant uh, physics model, theoretical physics model, is that there are two parameters that control the stability of a dominance hierarchy at the, at the most fundamental level. And he, he called them how, the degree of authoritarianism in the society. So what that means is, if you have a conflict with your employer, an institution, or another member of society, and they have a higher social status or more power than you, what is the probability that you can win that particular conflict? So if there's virtually zero probability that you're going to win if you're in a lower status, then that is a very authoritarian society. And as you have some probability of sometimes winning in the courts or wherever, then it's a less authoritarian society. So that is one parameter that controls these, uh, this organization. The other parameter is what he called the violence of the society or the violence of enforcement. And what that means is when you lose a battle with an institution or another person or a group or a powerful CEO or whatever, how much do you suffer from that loss? What is the punishment for having lost? Are you killed? Are you maimed? Are you put in prison? Do you pay a large fine? How large is that fine? The more the punishment for losing one of these conflicts within the dominance hierarchy, the more violent the society is. Those two parameters control the kind of society that you have. So you, if you are uh, far enough away from authoritarianism and violence, you can have a stable democracy. You can have a participatory democracy. You can have input from citizens. You can have input from organizations and associations. And you'll be able to, to have a structure that's maintained that way. But what, what the model predicts is that that structure in time will always very slowly creep towards a more authoritarian system. And so it has to be brought back. You have to adjust the authoritarianism and the violence in order to stay in that nice place where you want to be in a democracy, where most individuals have a better health than they would have otherwise. Otherwise, if you go too far towards authoritarianism and violence, you quickly go into the, an end state, which is a few people on top, everyone else at the bottom, and their personal individual health is very low, and they suffer being at the bottom, basically a kind of slavery. So that is the, that is the, that is the model, if you like, the theoretical model that a physicist would say can explain societies, okay? Now that's really important for health because you have to keep in mind, as I said, the stress that puts you there is what determines your health. So therefore, you, we, if you're interested in health, you have to be interested in the societal structure. And you, if you understand these principles, you know that if the courts are corrupt, you're not going to be able to keep a society in a democratic state. If the, if the checks and balances that allow the individual to win every once in a while, especially in the egregious cases of injustice, if they're not there, you're going straight to that hell of totalitarianism. So that's another thing that I've learned. Um, and another point that I want to make is that especially physicians, especially doctors, and everybody else also, we have to admit more and more. I'm saying we in a general way because I'm a physicist. But we have to admit that medicine itself is a massive killer. It's a massive cause of premature death of individuals. It, in many places, and depending on the circumstances, it can be the very first cause of death, I would say. We have to come to terms with that because medicine itself is an institution whose purpose is to stabilize the dominance hierarchy, and it will be manipulated by those who benefit from, a, from a, a society that is more totalitarian. It will be manipulated by them to make it more aggressive, to make the punishments, to make it more authoritarianism. Like, do you want to refuse a treatment? You can't. That's very authoritarian. The treatment might even be dangerous. That's very violent, and so on. And so the medical establishment itself, the institution, 
is fundamentally, needs to be understood in society as an institution that maintains the dominance hierarchy of the society. And it will be manipulated the same way that politicians are manipulated, the same way that the, the, the courts are manipulated, all the institutions that should be protecting us are going to be corrupted by the influence of the top people who benefit from a more totalitarian system. So that's another thing we have to, I think, admit about medicine. Um, and there's just a few other uh, scientific things that I want to point out that I think are very important, and some, some I've only discovered recently myself. So when you look at the big phenomenon, death is a very important parameter, and it's easy to measure. You're alive or you're dead, and you can count deaths. So that's why I look at all-cause mortality. I'm not going to believe what the clinician said about what caused my death, I'm going to believe that that person actually died, and I'm going to count them and hope that those numbers are not corrupted themselves. Now, when you look at all-cause mortality data across the over 100 years that, that many nations have been collecting this data faithfully, what you see is that in the Northern Hemisphere, there, there's always more death in the winter and less death in the summer. There's a seasonal cycle, and it is robust. That is a big macroscopic feature of health on, in human societies and on the planet. And what is fascinating is that this thing has been seen for now 100 years. I'll be showing some data tomorrow. What is fascinating that is that in the southern hemisphere, the maximum of death in that seasonal cycle is at their winter, which is our summer. It's inverted. There's a phase shift between the, the north and the southern hemisphere. And if you go to the equatorial regions, there is no seasonal variation in death rate with time. It is a flat line. There are not more deaths in summer or winter. There isn't even a summer or winter, okay? So it's a flat line. Now, that phenomenon has been known for about 100 years. It is the fundamental first discoveries of epidemiology. And guess what? There is no convincing and conclusive explanation of that phenomenon. All right, there are many hypotheses. People will argue about it. I've studied these, these articles and these hypotheses. It is not an understood phenomenon. And what's even more intriguing about this phenomenon is if you look at the seasonal structure within a season, you can find structure within the winter where you might have a first peak of mortality and then a shoulder within the winter. That structure is the same in the entire northern hemisphere at the same time, and it's synchronous. Synchronous across the northern hemisphere, you will find that same structure in that particular season. This is a fascinating phenomenon, and it has fascinated epidemiologists ever since they figured this out. And there are books written about how this could possibly be, and the hypotheses go from solar flares all the way to uh, viruses in particles that travel across in, in, in jet streams everywhere on Earth and all kinds of things, okay? But my point is, irrespective of what medical people will say about that they can diagnose influenza and influenza cases, and whatever they say about their diagnoses, this macroscopic phenomenon of mortality on the planet in human societies is to this day virtually not understood. So we have to admit our, our fundamental ignorance about a lot of things. And I think that's a very important point. Um, and finally, there's, a, there's two, more, two more interesting uh, scientific features like that. Another one is, and many actual medical uh, clinicians and doctors do not know this. They learn this from me for the first time when I tell this story. Some kind of vaguely remember that they heard something about it. And, and most uh, biologists and scientists didn't pay much attention to it, don't really remember it or know it, they don't have a memory of it. It's a very important observation. It's the following one. The chance that you die in the coming year, the probability that you will experience death in the coming year, that probability varies with age, obviously, but it varies exponentially with age. It's an exponential function. It's not just any function. It's not just an increase. It's an actual mathematical exponential increase with age. And it has a doubling time for all human societies throughout history, except when something catastrophic happens, like a meteorite hits the Earth or something. 
but it is robustly the same for all human societies and throughout history that the doubling time of that probability of death is about nine or ten years everywhere. Nine or ten years. So every nine or ten years in age, your probability that you will die in the next year doubles. Okay? Now, that is what I call something that is biologically fundamental. And you will find very few scientific articles about this phenomenon, and no one has explained it convincingly, not the exponential variation, nor the doubling time in years. It, there is no explanation for it at the moment. So these are the big problems of medical science. This is what the physicists would say, first we have to understand this, okay? And it's not understood. And this brings us to the final question, which is vaccines. There has been a mega experiment on Earth, as you know, with the rollout of these vaccines. But th that allows observations and the observation is how many people died immediately following a vaccine rollout. So you have a, va a quick vaccine rollout of, let's say, the first dose, or the second dose, or the first booster, or the second booster, and immediately following that, there is a peak in all-cause mortality. I'm not going to argue about what the cause of death attributed is. No, all-cause mortality has a peak, okay? Now, when you quantify... The, the deaths in that peak and relate it to the number of doses of the vaccine given, what you find is that the deaths that are therefore caused by the vaccine, that are accelerated by the vaccine, even though they may in the end be largely mechanistically about pneumonia, if there not, had not been that rollout, there would not have been that peak of death. There would not have been those extra deaths, okay? Those deaths go exponentially, per, per dose, go exponentially with age. Exponentially with age. And the doubling time is not the same as the universal doubling time for societies. It is about half. It's about four or five years. That tells you that it's not the same phenomenon. In fact, that suggests to me that it's a classic problem of toxicology. So in our work, we have analyzed this and, try and, and come to understand it as a mass poisoning exercise. So this is a toxic substance. Whether or not you will suffer serious consequences is extremely dependent on the individual, just as is the case in all toxic uh, studies. Um, and it increases with your age, the likelihood that you will get severe harm or die. And it, now we know that this is the first most detailed toxicology study where we actually get the exponential variation and we can, for this particular kind of product, put it directly into your, into your system, we can get a half-life of four or five years, which is not, is, again, it's one of these macro phenomena that we have, I, I would say, discovered that we were the first to demonstrate and that needs to be explained. So it's related to, to uh, mortality in general. So those are my uh, big thoughts of the day that I wanted to communicate with you, to you uh, at, this, at this presentation.